All right, so here we have a patient with a cephalic insertion. It's difficult to tell what the catheter to vein ratio was at the beginning. I'm gonna assume that the clinician put in an appropriate catheter to vein ratio. However, when we're assessing it today, you're gonna to see that the catheter to vein ratio is grossly inappropriate. Not that they're predicting it. However, in my experience, anecdotally, the cephalic vein seems to spasm or decrease in, in vein size significantly majority of the time that I place it. This is why I prefer the 22 gauge, a 6.4 centimeter catheter for this vein here. That way there's enough catheter to vein ratio when the vein does spasm. And I always bank on and plan for the cephalic to spasm and get smaller. So today we're gonna replace it for the brachial insertion. There's a couple of things wrong here. You're gonna see the disc slit was pointed away from the tail. Even though the insertion was barely at the green zone, bordering the red zone. So if we divide, subdivide from the AC crease, section off a third and a third. So this is the yellow zone right here. This is the red zone. This is the green zone. The insertion was placed really close to the border of the red, but still in the green in my opinion. However, instead of taping the tail up away from the crease, the entire dressing was placed on the crease. This dressing was well adhered to the skin, even in the red zone. So disrupt the dressing. Actually, I'm gonna get a detach all so it doesn't hurt her because this is a fresh dressing and trying to remove this is gonna be painful. So we're gonna use a detach all to remove the dressing so it's less painful. And then we're going to uh, deal with that bio patch. But patient reports that because the tail was pointed down this way towards the hand and pointed distal, the bending of her elbow is uncomfortable because because of the hardware that was in this area. So it was uncomfortable for the patient throughout the day because of the way it was dressed. Why they did not turn it up, I don't know. I can't find a good excuse for it. However, it is what it is. And so we're gonna place it closer into the green center of the green zone. And we're gonna point it away from the flexion. That way the patient can uh, resume their ADLs comfortably. We have the detach all today. So we're gonna detach this and we're gonna remove this. With the detach alls, you want to crack the vial in the casing, in the packaging. So we're gonna slowly, no pain, right? Yeah, no pain. Does it hurt when they take it off at the hospital? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this is some magic. detach is really good for removing all adhesives from what I hear. Now, another way to cheat is to take saline and get underneath. Mm -hmm. They do have lot, much bigger vials, although I have yet to get a hold of some. Hint, hint, if I can get some of those longer vials. I really like these scrub hub because they go into the crevices. Because the slit is open this way, mm -hmm. I have to be more careful. If you come across this, the problem with this catheter is that when you're when you're not careful with the dressing change, you're gonna piston that catheter out mm -hmm. like this. Why? Because of the orientation of the slit mm -hmm. has now hooked the catheter. And when you manipulate or try to pull this off, it'll pull the catheter out. So my recommendation is, if you come across this poorly placed disc, is to slowly go away oh. from the tail Mm -hmm. to gently get off mm -hmm. and then look how now I need to manipulate this area mm -hmm. and then be even more careful because of the way it was placed. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to wash. It's already leaking. You could see the yeah. fluid coming out. Yeah, I saw it last night. Did it, was it painful when I flushed? No. Just now? Okay. I'm going to flush a little bit more. Did you guys see that? Yeah, it's leaking. That's, that's pretty much a complete obstruction. We're gonna take a look for sure. We're gonna look under the ultrasound to see. So here is the patient's insertion site. Right now you can see that it's definitely too small. Look at that. We're gonna be as gentle with our pressure as possible so we're not compressing the vein. So we're gonna capture that and then we're gonna keep going. Did you see how it's compressible here? The tissue is compressible at this point, and I'm gonna, let's see where it enters the vein. It enters the vein about here. So I'm gonna measure that catheter to vein ratio. That when I'm compressing the vein or attempting to, it doesn't compress all the way around, like right here. So notice that when I'm compressing the vein, there's a dark spot here, there's a dark spot there, there's a hyperechoic image here. But in this area, where there isn't so much of an occlusion or thrombus, or most of the vein is hugging around that catheter. 
So there isn't an obstruction or a thrombosis around here. However, here, there's a significant amount of the vein that's maintaining a circular structure during the compression and there's space between the catheter itself and the vein wall. There's something holding it open and it shouldn't when I'm compressing. And even more so here, look at that. Even more circular, even more solidified structure. Let's find the tip of the catheter, which is like right about there. So at about here, you could see the vein here. The vein right here is pretty compressible. Probably has a decent flow rate too. Look at that, complete compression, vein wall to vein wall here. However, let's observe the catheter tip. And today I'm actually using the Clarius, which has a much cleaner image but it has its own drawbacks, which we'll talk about later. This part is distinctly the catheter and it stops right about here. However, I'm not sure if it extends out this way or if this is a clot. Luckily, this is not a life-threatening clot. It's just a nuisance of a extra luminal thrombosis, probably even a fibrin tail. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna flush. And we're gonna see what happens. Look at that. So. Look at that. So look at that. So catheter tip actually is terminating here. This hyperechoic uh, luminal structure is actually the fibrin tail and watch it move forward as I flush. That fibrin tail is moving forward. Do you guys see that? That expansion of the fibrin sheath? I feel a little bit pressure. Do you feel pain? pressure just pressure right and do you guys see that leaking around the catheter or around the insertion site so i believe and you can still see flowing right about there you could still see the blood flowing around that fibrin sheath so i'm not flushing right now and there's still movement of blood which looks like corresponding with or pulsation of the heart. So there's still fluid moving, there's still blood moving around that thrombus. It's just the flush from the catheter is flowing in between the fibrin sheath and the catheter itself, but it's not actually exiting. Let's see. I don't think it's actually exiting into the vein. Here, let's see what happens when I flush. It expands, but it's difficult to tell if it's a, yeah, a little bit. It's still so. Yeah, it's still leaking. Does it hurt? No, but pressure. No. Yeah, you feel pressure. So she's feeling pressure from that fibrin sheath being expanding during the pressure from the flush. So it looks like there was a significant fibrin tail that developed. Okay, let's, it's hard to tell where it ends, but let's see. I want you to keep an eye up to here. It looks like the fibrin tail stops at about here to here, somewhere around this area. So keep an eye on where you see my mouse dot, this is about where it's gonna end, the fibrin tail, where it looks like it's ending. Somewhere around there. Yeah. Okay. Somewhere in the middle of the screen, it's being instructed. However, you can see that the fibrin tail was influenced by the flush. And look at the amount that it's expanding from my flush. Any pain or just pressure? Pressure. Pressure, okay. And you can see it leaking out. So it's most of the medication is actually not leaving into the vein. This is a bad IV catheter. Not that it was placed poorly. However, it is bad now. It is no good at this time. So we're gonna remove it and give her one in the brachial and use that vein instead. You guys see that fibrin tail left behind? And this is why it's hard to know after removal. If we did not look at this under ultrasound, we would never have known that was a fibrin tail, especially if that fibrin tail disappeared. Look how it's staying in place. That fibrin tail is going nowhere and it's gonna be left behind. Look at that. And so without the ultrasound, the investigation would have been impossible or we wouldn't have as much as 
as good of an idea of what's going on. Okay, now it's kind of caught on. Now it's not. See how the fibrin tail is staying put? It looks like at the valve. It's getting caught at the valves. So wherever there's a valve, it's going to catch and hold on to that clot. What sucks about these linear probes or the ultrasound technology is that it's a straight line. So any curvature of the vein is going to cause us to lose visualization of the long view. So that's why this technique is quite difficult to do. However, if you can do it, I highly recommend you practice. I don't see any remnants of a fiber and tail here during this removal. It looks like it's just passing through the venous tissue. And I have a feeling, well, we'll see. I don't think this one's even gonna bleed. And now there's, okay, so there's another piece of the fibrin tail or fibrin sheath under the vein. You can see this hyperechoic lining is either a valve or fibrin sheath. And I think it's a fibrin sheath, we'll see. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely fibrin sheath. Well, I don't know, could it still be a valve with the leaflet of the valve that maintain its structure. Not even bleeding, which indicates to me that there was a significant obstruction. And you can see here that there's a tiny bit of hyperchoic lining on the inside here, which indicates to me that's a form of thrombosis. You can see that hyperchoic imaging here it's in the center of the vein. And do you see how when I compress, the veins don't collapse completely into a flat line? but there's still a circular structure maintained. And right here as well. So that's some kind of thrombus there where there's still a circular shape to the vein, even after compression. Look at that. That's a, that's a very prominently circular structure that's not collapsing completely. And you can see that hazy hyperechoic image a clear vein should be easily compressible with darkness and no haziness. So haziness is an indication of either a, an artifact or a thrombus. So this clot will spontaneously resolve and just go away over time. And it's pretty adhered and caught by the pathway of the veins. Still non-compressibility there. So it seems to be a thrombus up from, let's say from here. And this is about, here's where the vein completely clouds. Look at how the vein disappears completely or almost. So let's say the, fire, the, the thrombosis ends here. And then there's like a partial here, partial, partial, and then it becomes clear. And then a partial, 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 all the way to the insertion site. I like to do a full minute, even though it pains me. So we're gonna insert it about here. And I don't like to four midlines because I seem to change my mind about exactly where I'm gonna go. Go for a full minute. How long you been in this field? Mm, about f seven years now. Yeah. You seem love it. Oh yeah, I do like it. Like a scientist? Oh yeah, for sure. For sure. That's a good though. Yeah, if I didn't like it, I would oh. quit. Okay, so just a little bit of saline. Look at that. Image is still that. Now, there it is. She's got a good brachial next to the artery, but there's a nerve bundle there. 
All right, so this is a recap of identifying structures. My philosophy is that you cannot truly know what a structure is unless the ultrasound image is in motion. So I'm gonna highlight these pieces for you, but I want you to watch it in motion. The reason is you cannot just identify by a circular structure or a hyperechoic or porous looking structure. Uh, you may take good guesses and make good guesses. However, you still need to put that ultrasound in that tissue in motion to identify what it is more accurately. What do I mean by this? Here I see one, two, three, four, maybe even five, six different circular structures. I'm going to try to identify them for you. Here's one, two, three, four, and five, and here is actually six. So I see six potential anatomical structures for us to consider or be observant of during needling because we do not want to perforate through or into the wrong tissue and so so for this still image we're going to use blue as our vein red as our artery and yellow as our nerve bundle for now we're not going to go over lymph nodes muscles fascia bands or anything on this particular take so this is the basilic vein away from the brachial complex. So usually it's very and quite separated from the, the brachial artery. So here we have the brachial artery and you'll see that it is not as easily compressible. Remember when I said we have to put the ultrasound in motion, the tissue in motion, in movement to be able to identify properly. When we compress, you'll notice that, and when I said compress, when I press down the probe on the arm or the tissue, you're gonna notice that that this particular structure is not going to compress as easily. I use these words carefully because you can still compress the artery. Try pressing as hard as you can, you're gonna see that artery collapse. However, they're not as easily compressible as the veins. And so you'll find that the veins will collapse much quicker than the arteries. However, this is not always the case. This is why I do not want my orientees or people that I'm training to apply the tourniquet or use the tourniquet during insertions or assessments, only in extenuating circumstances where you are in a rush and the speed is more important to you and the patient, then I recommend using the tourniquet. However, otherwise, you should be inserting without the tourniquet. And there's a lot of reasons I'm not going to get into why. You're going to notice that these two structures are going to compress more easily during the compression phase of the assessment. And this is going to compress a lot less. And this here is the nerve bundle and it's going to compress almost nil. Do they compress? Yes, but they are the least compressible structure. From my experience, the majority of nerve bundles will compress the least, meaning the arteries and the veins will compress before you can even compress a nerve bundle and it'll be very uncomfortable for the patient. However, that will help you to identify that it is a nerve bundle. If this object compresses easily, assume that it is not a nerve bundle and some other type of tissue. You can see that it's kind of spotty. It almost looks porous or someone said chocolate chip cookie or a honeycomb. And you'll see as we move this structure, the inside is going to be quite porous and those are usually the nerve bundles. Now the nerve bundle has a very, very tough outer layer and tissue surrounding it. It is hard to puncture, although you can. They will generally move out of the way. However, if you are persistent in chasing after it or ignore it with a straight down vector through the center, you will poke through the brachial nerve complex. Now, what are the symptoms to correlate with nerve dissection or nerve puncture? They're going to feel shooting sharp pain to their fingers. Patients, listen up. Also, so you can keep us accountable, if you feel shooting sharp pain, not numbness or tingling. Numbness or tingling is most likely your arm just falling asleep from the awkward position. However, shooting sharp pain, electrical pain to your fingertips is not normal. Clinicians, listen to your patients when they say they have this particular pain. You're poking their arm, not their fingers. So they should not be feeling sharp shooting electrical pain. Nerve 
nerve pain in their fingers. If they do, you must pull back immediately. It does not mean you have to restart the insertion. It just means that you have to pull away from that structure that looks like this. And the nerve bundle will generally lie around on top or next to the brachial artery. Remember, our tissues need supply. And what is the most important tissue here? It's your nerve endings. So your arteries, the blood from your artery is going to supply the oxygen much more efficiently if that nerve bundle is next to you. Now, is that always the case? Of course not. However, generally most cases that nerve bundle will be close to if not next to the brachial artery. So I want you to watch as we compress the tissue, look at the veins, look how easily they compress, look at the pulsatile action. It is more pulsatile than the veins. Why do I say that? Again, veins can still pulsate. They actually do. However, they don't pulsate as prominently because the pressure is so much lower than the arteries. You'll notice with very rare cases where the all structures will pulsate. And a lot of times this is due to some kind of cardiac output insufficiency or reflux or post exertion. Uh, I have a few videos on that you can check out. However, know that I'm using the word least and not only or least or most. So to recap, the Nerve bundles are the least compressible, the arteries are the second least compressible, and the veins are the most compressible. And the arteries generally pulsate more often than not. You'll be able to observe pulsation more easily than the veins. And the nerve bundles will shift around, however, they generally are hard to compress, the hardest to compress. Right, right above on, on the left half of that vein, Let's see how her, bacill her bacillus catheter to vein ratio is not favorable. So remember, we had that issue before, and so we're not gonna repeat the same mistake and insert at the most optimal catheter to vein ratio here. Now, remember, where you visualize the best point of CVR is not the point that you're gonna enter the skin. So you wanna map that out pretty good. So here's a great catheter to vein ratio. However, I'm not gonna insert there. We have, so elbows right here, the axilla crease is here. And so this is about right in the middle. And so I'm actually, and do you see how the weight of the probe is completely compressing the veins? I have to actively lift up the probe to not compress the veins. This is something that you also have to be mindful of, okay? I'm literally just, the weight of the probe itself is compressing, so you have to constantly be holding that up to decompress those veins. So I'm gonna approach a little bit from the left, from the right. You can see that my vein is a little bit off center because I want to approach, I want to tap that vein right here. However, I have about a five centimeter lead that I'm probably gonna track from the skin, maybe even four. So we're gonna start from here. Remember the butterfly probe is fat. So you wanna take into account that extra centimeter from the center line where the ultrasound beam is actually emitting from. So we're gonna insert from here. You ready for the pinch? Mm -hmm. Here we go. So from here you want a good intradermal wheel. If you do not see that intradermal wheel, is it burn a little bit? Yeah. Uh -huh. Is it a lot or a little bit? A little bit. A little spicy? A little bit. So I like to put a generous amount. That skin needs to raise and you should see like even uh, pockets of the, of the dermal layers opening up. If you do not see that skin raising, you're too deep and the lidocaine is ineffective. You gotta make sure you see that wheel or else you just injected a useless amount of lidocaine unnecessarily into the subcutaneous tissue with little to no efficacy. Can you feel this? Not yet. Pinch? What about now? Okay. You feel pain? No. No? Oh, now I feel pain. Pain there? Oh, so it's gonna take a little bit longer to... I'm gonna inject lidocaine while I'm going. Pain? A little bit. Okay. So I'm going to let that lidocaine give that time to work a little bit more. Because when that dilator goes in, I need to make sure she doesn't feel much. There's my needle. Pain? All right, so here I'm mapping out the vein. The, the brachial vein is here. Now, did you notice how when I'm over the needle, I can't see the needle tip right now. However, when I 
tilt or fan the probe, look how prominent that needle tip becomes. And so I'm going to keep that same tilted position and slide. And I'm gonna use gel for you guys because it does make the sliding a little bit easier, actually a lot easier. Normally I would not use gel for quick insertions like this. However, if it helps to visualize, we should do it. There we go. So is that my tip or is that just a reflection? I think it's just tissue. Why? Because look at how dramatically, even though it is a bright hyperchoic dot, when I dramatically move the needle, it's not moving with me. So I'm gonna keep sliding it forward. Now that dot, very bright, is moving as I'm moving my needle tip. Now, how do I know that's a tip? Because when I slide the probe away from the field of view of the needle, I don't see the needle anymore. That's when you know you've went past the edge of the needle. So I'm gonna bring that probe back until I start to see a small bit. Now that is a tip. Why? Because the image of the needle tip, that dot is coming into view as I'm getting the probe closer to the needle. So I'm going to go at a little bit of a steeper angle. Any pain? Does it hurt? No, good. I'm gonna inject a little bit here. She's gonna feel that burning. That's normal. And again, I'm tilting it even more to be able to see. And I hope you're able to see how much I'm actually tilting. That's, that's the key. A lot of people miss this part. This is why I don't use needle guides because you cannot use this dynamic technique to visualize that, that needle tip better. Okay, there we go. So I'm going to keep the needle still and then slide the probe till it disappears. And I'm going to go about a millimeter or two past the tip and then bring the needle into field of view of my probe. Now, that was a pretty significant jump in tissue or in the needle movement. So I'm gonna inject here. Do you guys see this needle tip right here? I'm gonna inject a little bit of lidocaine. Do you feel burning in your arm? No. No, that's good. I wanna make sure she doesn't feel that dilator because I've had patients, some people don't believe in it. Uh, I buy into it because I've had patients in extreme pain when the dilator went in. And we're not talking about at the skin either. They felt it deep in the arm. So I like to coat the vein. Okay, there we go. So now, how do I know if I'm in the vein or not? Take a look. Yeah, I haven't entered the endothelial lining here. I'm gonna draw back, nothing. That blood should have come out very easily, but it didn't. Because I only punctured maybe like a layer of fascia from here, even though it looks like, there's a shadow. Even though it looks like the tip, there we go. The tip has passed the endothelial lining, it hasn't, it's actually just dimpling it. So I'm gonna apply a little bit of lidocaine there. Do you feel burning there? No. Good, it's easy for you. Okay, so now I'm gonna puncture through that vein. So how do I know that I haven't punctured yet? Because when I bring the probe back to perpendicular to the vein, I can still see the needle but do you see the tissue moving? As I'm moving the needle, inserting the needle further to the other side of the wall, you can see the tissue at the top moving. The tissue at the top of the vein is moving with my needle. 
If my needle was fully inside of the vein, you would not see that tissue moving so prominently. And we'll show you the difference. So this is with the needle still snagged at the endothelium. And I'm going to level out the needle. And you can see my angle changing at the needle. And I'm going to advance the probe till it disappears. There's no needle tip here. However, when I advance it by like a millimeter, you'll see that millimeter. You'll see that. You'll see that. By like a millimeter, you'll see that pop up. You'll see that pop up. Did you see that? That little quick release of the tissue? I still don't know if I'm through yet. I don't think I am. I think I maybe hit the tunica media, but I don't think I hit the uh, tunica interna just yet. We'll see. Pain? Does that hurt? No. Okay, good. All right. I think we're good here. Now I have very little. Let's see, where did that needle tip go? There it is. Okay, I have lost angle. Bam, did you guys hear and see that snap? Bam, did you guys hear and see that snap? Bam, did you guys hear and see that snap? Now it feels super smooth. So what I'm going to do is rotate the needle. Did that hurt? No. So what I'm going to do is rotate the needle. Did that hurt? No. So what I'm going to do is rotate the needle. Did that hurt? No. Good. And then I'm gonna continue at this angle. Yeah, that feels super smooth. Do you notice how when I'm moving the tissue here, when I'm moving the tissue, the top layer isn't moving. You can see the tissue at the top moving. The tissue at the top of the vein is moving with my needle. It's pulsating because the artery is shifting the surrounding tissue, but the top of the vein is not moving and corresponding with my needle movement. This means I'm fully inside of the vein compared to what it was earlier. Okay. So we're almost hubbed at this point. Any pain? No? I think she fell asleep. What's your question? Did you fall asleep? Mm -hmm. <laughs> good that's mm -hmm. good that means you're not in pain no, no. I'm going to rotate it back so that the bevel's facing up but notice that when I move the needle up and down the top of the tissue that originally was snagged with the endothelial lining of the vein is not moving and corresponding with the movement of my needle that mm -hmm. means we're past the lining of the vein and where actually the tip of the catheter is actually inside. So that's another indicator for you to know whether you're inside or not. Remove this and I'm expecting some amount of blood return. And let's check before we do that. Actually, no, I don't like to mess you my, my lidocaine. Okay, you guys see that blood coming out? Look at that blood return. That means we're in a vessel somewhere and she does not have a lot of venous pressure, which I don't know how I feel about that right now. It's going in smooth, no resistance, past maybe a valve. There it is. Okay. 
So now that we have access to the vein, I'm going to close this up. I don't like to retract my needle immediately in case we have a problem. So I'm gonna put that away for good luck and then go for the dilator. Now, before I dilate and traumatize the tissue, I'm going to, and so what did I just do with the wet skin? I wiped off the residue of the chlorhexidine. So I need to deal with that and by wiping it again later. problem with these dilators is that they are so thin. Okay. Please go there, please go there. Good, I felt the vein. Now it's in. And I like to put gauze underneath to minimize the amount of blood I need to deal with later. And put the guide wire in through here. Get this catheter. Now, this is an 11, 11 centimeter catheter vein purchase. However, this is a seven centimeter dilator. So I need to be careful not to lose vein purchase because I was careless during my sheath removal. And these catheters, all of them are tapered, but this one in particular stops at about two centimeters. So now I'm gonna break And I, how many centimeters that exposed? That is three centimeters exposed. And so I wanna shove that back in while it's broken to main, make sure that I'm not losing access to the vein. And so from here, I'm going to apply tension. Basically what was going on there is I was continuing to apply pressure by pushing the catheter in while pulling this out. Now what else you can do is put your put pressure with your finger, index finger, at the insertion site to keep that catheter from coming out and then split the sheath at the skin. I know there's lots of techniques out there, for, but for me, this is the easiest and quickest way to do it. Some people are worried about tearing the skin apart that way. It's, I'm 110% sure that's not gonna happen. The skin is extremely thick horizontally. Here's my lidocaine to help clean up the blood, make sure it's nice and clean for the patient. Okay, so now I had a little bit of an issue with the dilation, so the skin's a little tough. I'm gonna use this as a crowbar to open up a larger hole for the secure cath here. So, do that. Any pain? Not yet. Good, there we go. So I'm gonna do that. I like to give it a little stretch if I can finagle. It. It's a little difficult because of how shallow it is. There we go. Okay. Now I'm going to take the secure cath. And with these hydrophilic catheters, there are no studies on cyanoacrylate glue. I know that's the, the craze right now, and it's actually got some utility, but I don't think there's any studies on whether it's going to cause these hydrophilic catheters to break down. So until that's done, I highly recommend not using cyanoacrylate glue on hydrophilic catheters. So this is now deep in the skin. I want to make sure I'm fully submerged under the dermal layer and into the subcutaneous layer. And I'm gonna rotate it while it's still there. And when I release, yeah, it's still not in the skin. The teeth were crossed, the legs were crossed. When the legs are crossed, it indicates to me that I'm not fully in the skin. Now they're not crossed, so I'm fully in. I can see feet number one, and feet number two, the left feet and the right feet pressing up against the skin. Does that hurt? No. Okay, you fell asleep again? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's good. It's a, it's a nice little compliment for me. Okay, so we pull out about three centimeters and then we're gonna close the clamp. We need to make sure that the catheter is dwelling in between these blue, the blue slit here. You gotta make sure that it's sitting beautifully in between the blue slit, and then we put the cap on. There we go. Now this is really secure. And another thing to check is, as you assess the, knot, the, the nub of the feet, pressing up against the skin, it is the catheter in between the feet. That's when you know it's placed properly. Okay, so we got this. It's gonna be easy to dress 
and not screw up. So now we're gonna reapply the chlorhexidine and we're reapplying so that the residue of the chlorhexidine will sit on the skin and continue to have an antimicrobial effect for a few more days after the insertion. Now imagine during the dressing changes, look at how easy this scrub is going to be. I can get underneath everything underneath the hub where bacteria could be growing or is growing um, under at the insertion site. If it was sutured, I would not be able to get underneath without pistoning that catheter. Mm -hmm. So now I can reapply the chlorhexidine around that insertion site very comfortably, very quickly without worrying about accidentally dislodging the catheter. Look how quick and easy this is. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you guys about the silver disc. This is where a lot of people get things confused. These, this is Silveron. It is a silver activated antimicrobial. With the silver discs, you have to give it a few drops of saline. You have to wet it. If it's not wet, you'll decrease the efficacy of it. So get this going, squeeze out the excess fluids. And then this dark piece is, uh, this is why we do second gloves. This dark part is the antimicrobial activity. It is not this white part. This is the opposite of Biopatch, Gardeva, and most of your CHG discs. There's no label, there's no name. However, this dark part is the silver itself and you want this in contact with the skin. Don't get that confused. So we're gonna apply that, very good. And then we're gonna apply the dress. Now, previously, patient is going to plan on having this for more than seven days of dwell. So I'm going to use Mastisol to help the patient maintain integrity of the dressing. I don't know what's gonna happen past the seven days. Got great blood return, nice flush. Any pain? No. No, very good. I'm gonna show you guys something interesting. I don't know if you can see it very well. You guys see those bubbles on, those small bubbles on the, uh, in the tubing? If you can see it, why don't you see what happens when I remove this? Did it move in and out? That's the key. I'll show you guys why these TKOs are so important. But if you don't understand why it's impo so important that those bubbles did not move, you're not gonna understand why these lines are clotting. And we're gonna show you that later. Packaging is not sterile. However, the vial itself is sterile, but the chemical is not. So you want to make sure you're not putting this in the insertion site, but you're applying it around the dressing and at the borders of the dressing. So I like to crack it and then invert. Let that applicator tip fill with Massasol. So I'm going to map out the dressing. We're gonna do it like this. And so about here. So we do want to, even though the, the secure cat is on, we do want to cover the wings. So right about here is probably where we'll go. So at the wing, and you don't need to cake it on. You just need like about a layer of it. So we got one line for the Massasol and we are going to tape it down all the way. Cover the wings. And now the patient is able to there we go. There you go. And while I'm lifting up the edges, you do want to be careful and hold the edges down while you're removing because it will lift the dressing and it might disrupt the dressing a little bit. So, and of course, put this down, date and time it. And then we're good. Nice, so that original insertion side is covered. Okay. And do you guys notice I'm not applying the stat lock or sutures or anything else. I don't need any of that. In fact, if you apply stat lock or anything else, it's just gonna get in the way. It's not extra securement. If the patient is strong enough to pull the secure cath or catheter out of the secure cath, that stat lock isn't gonna do anything for the patient except get in the way of the care maintenance. So you don't need to apply anything else if this is applied. Save your money, save your time. You did very good. You did good job, that's Thank why you. I'm far sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> did it, was it better or worse than the last time? Same? Better, better, okay, good. very gentle. Very good, very good. Mm -hmm. Are you, can you move your arm? Go ahead. Yeah, okay. Yeah. It's kind of stiff because I've been like more than 10 days, you know, like this all the time, so now.
Now yeah. it feels better. Yeah, okay. okay. So the patient was saying, this feels a lot more comfortable because now the previous dressing was right here. So she had to keep her arm extended every night that she slept. But now that she could bend her arm while sleeping, she's going to be a lot more comfortable at night. I know it's not important to some of you, but a good night's rest and being comfortable while sleeping is key to healing. 